Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Lenatra, State Representative of the 12th Plymouth District, representing the towns of Kingston, Plimpton, Halifax, parts of Plymouth, Duxbury, and Middleborough. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Profiles. This program allows me to take time each month to highlight the unsung people, programs, and events that make the 12th District so special. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I do. On today's show, I am joined by Sherry Boone, as well as Sandra Blatchford. Sherry was involved in a domestic violence incident in 2017, where she almost lost her life. Since then, she has worked hard to bring awareness to domestic violence, its survivors, and the toll that it can take on the survivors and families. She has worked to advocate for survivors and has worked with legislators to file legislation to prevent domestic violence situations and protect survivors. We are also joined by Sherry's advocate, Sandra Blatchford of the South Shore Resource Advocacy Center. Sherry and Sandra, thank you so much for joining me here today. Sure. So Sherry, we've <coughs> talked, we met probably, how long has it been now? Probably a month, right? Maybe even Couple longer? Months, yeah. Um, and we met when the governor's office reached out to me and asked if I would help you testify at the dangerousness bill hearing. Right. Um, and you came into my office and told me your story and the hair on my arm stood up as I told you because I had just driven by after that happened. Right. So would you mind telling us your story of what happened? Okay, yeah. Um, so this was in November of 2017 and um, previous to that I had been dating somebody for about three and a half years um, and at the point of this happening to me, we had been not together for about a year and a half. Um, although he, you know, wanted to get back together and I, you know, just kept saying no. Um, he, uh, I was down at a, at a, at a pond and, um, he had gotten in my car and, um, and, um, he pulled out a knife, um, very long bladed knife and, um, he stabbed me several times, and I was trying to fight him off the whole time that um, we were in the car. And um, finally, he got out of the car, um, and I drove away because I was panicking that he was going to go to my home and get my kids and my grandson. Um, so as I was driving away from there, um, before the the door even shut of him getting out of the car, I um, was calling 911. I was on the phone with 911 and they were telling me that I needed to pull over. And I told them I couldn't. I said, I have to get home, uh, which was about a mile and a quarter away from the pond. And I told them that I had to get home because I was afraid that he was gonna go there and he was gonna get, you know, hurt my kids and my grandson. Uh, so I'm on the phone with her and she's, you know, having, um, the, it was in, it happened in Pembroke, but I ended up in Hanson driving and, um, I had gotten as far as I could driving and because I lost so much blood, um, it's so hard to tell. You're so strong every time you talk about it. You really it's are. Okay. Um, so I ended up having to pull over and I was about a quarter of a mile from my home. And um, finally the, you know, the police and everybody had gotten there and I told them, you know, they needed to get to my home because I was afraid he was gonna go there and get my kids and my grandson. So they did send some cops over there and everything, but um, you know, they were asking me who it was and it, like I said to them, it was an ex-boyfriend of mine, um, Mario Ficini. And, um, I, um, my injuries were so severe that they ended up having to med flight me. Um, and I was lucky enough that the med flight were in Halifax, the next town over, they were doing some runs and, and, and stuff. So um, they were there pretty quick to the field. They actually got to the field before we did in Hanson. And um, they brought me, you know, they med flighted me in to Mass General, and um, I was in surgery for about eight hours, nine hours, and um, I had actually died on the table three times, but because of the amazing doctors that are at Mass General, they saved my life. 
and um, I know, but it doesn't get any easier telling your story. Um, no, it doesn't. No, it really but doesn't. It's so important. Yeah. It's so important. We've discussed this, and you're gathering so much strength each time you tell it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's very empowering. Yes. Um, and to try and do what I've, you know, been doing to um, hopefully, like, a I always say, even if it just helps one person. It's so important. You know. Um, and you've been advocating so much, and I can say I'm proud of you. So we'll go to, let's, you were on the operating table for eight hours, um, and during that time when you were in the hospital, they had a hearing, and a lot of people don't know what a dangerousness hearing is. So while you were in the hospital, um, <coughs> that monster, I'm going to use the words that you use, yep. that so monster was in court and they had a dangerousness hearing. Can you explain what that is? Or Sandra, do you want to explain that that is? Which one's easier? Um, I know just from like my yeah. experience. Why don't you tell your with experience it. with it? Um, I mean, I wasn't there in court, right. but um, you know, from what I was told and everything, um, what happened was they do a dangerousness hearing, um, which is basically depending on the charges that they're bringing against them mm -hmm. um, to see whether or not they, you know, that the judge feels as though they're dangerous. And they did find him dangerous. Um, and when they do, they hold them. Sometimes it's 90 days, 120, 180, you know. Um, so he was held on that. And so he was held at the Plymouth House of, Correc uh, Plymouth House of Correction. Mm -hmm. And when his time was up, for that, they gave him bail at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars cash, and fortunately for me, he was not able to pay that bail. Um, so he stayed, you know, in Plymouth House of Correction. And um, but if he and, and what I don't understand is who says that he's not dangerous just because he was held for whatever amount of days they do. Who's who's to say that they're not? The judge just at that point, you know usually will give the, give them some type of bail mm -hmm. um, and like I said fortunately for me mine you know he couldn't pay it so he stayed and he actually stayed there for the whole time which was about 15 months until all of the court case was over um, and he ended up pleading guilty and he went to um, Walpole and then from there um, like right now he's in Shirley um, so the dangerousness hearing like you said, it, it, there's 90, 120, I believe, 180 yeah. days, yes. right? So if he could make that bail, right. 250000 <clears> is it 250 or is it a percentage of that? Do you know that, Sandra? Well, what I know mine was 250000 cash. cash. Okay. So it had so to be that. So if he made that bail, he would have been out for 15 months before his yep. the trial began. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want everyone to understand that. This is a man that attempted to murder you. Yep. And he was held for only 180 days because they considered him dangerous because he stabbed you several times. But after that 180 days, if he could make that bail, he would be out for 15 months. Exactly. And we know how fast time goes by. Mm -hmm. And as we've discussed before, and Sandra, you may be able to speak to this too, I mean, they're sitting there and they're probably stewing on this and blaming right. the victim, correct? Absolutely. So uh, when does Cell Shore Advocacy come in to, to help? So we can come in to help as soon as the incident occurs. So mm -hmm. Sherry worked with her advocate, Karen Fabrizio, who's here today. Yes. Who's here today. Um, but we will respond immediately. So if the police or the hospital were to contact us, Karen actually is our backup person who responds 24-7. So mm -hmm. during office hours, we're, we have a number of advocates who are available to respond. And there are certain advocates who cover different towns. So Karen actually covers the town of Pembroke. Mm -hmm. um, and so she covers actually a, a lot of towns. Uh, but what we would do is during the day, that advocate would respond to the hospital or to the police department. 
once the office at office is closed, Karen is the designated person who responds immediately. So if the police contact our agency or the hospital contacts our agency or if a victim contacts our agency, we will respond and we will have an advocate go out to the hospital or to the police. So in Sherry's case, it would be that Karen would have been contacted and if Sherry wanted her to, Karen can go to the hospital mm -hmm. and meet with Sherry then. Um, so our services start as soon as a referral is made and the victim is requesting our services. Do they ever decline your services? They're absolutely, because oftentimes you may not be ready. And I know that one of the things is that oftentimes when someone hears that, you know, we can contact the domestic violence agency, a lot of survivors may feel as though, oh no, they're going to tell me that I have to leave the relationship or they're going to tell me what I need to do because not every person where the hospital is calling or the police are calling is ready to mm -hmm. leave the relationship. The, there are many things that go on. So one of the things that I would like to you know, really articulate is that we don't ever do that that we really follow the lead of the person we are working with. So that whatever somebody is telling us they need from us mm -hmm. is what we honor. So if, let's say someone's in the hospital and a nurse says we can call, you know, I can call South Shore, if a victim is still in the relationship, they may decline because they're saying, uh-uh, they're gonna tell me I have to leave and I don't want to. And what we try to convey is that, no, actually, we're here to support you. We're here to support you whether you're in the relationship, out of the relationship, or thinking about leaving the relationship, or wherever you may be in the context of that relationship. But we absolutely do have people who decline. That's very important that you made that distinction, because I would assume that, too. Um, and, and Sherry left the relationship a absolutely. year. Mm -hmm. You were a year and a year half. And a half. It was a yeah. year and a half. Did you see any signs then while you were in the relationship? When I was in the relationship, um, yes. Um, you know, he was verbally abusive, mm -hmm. um, never physically right. abusive to me, but uh, verbally, definitely verbally abusive. Um, and that's, you know, why we ended up among right. other things. Right. But, you know, that's why we broke up or whatever. Um, and like I said, we were together for a year and a half when this happened. And because he, you know, wanted to get back together. You know, I had asked several times yeah. about getting back together. And I just told him, no, we're not. You know? So when I look back on it, I try to think, like, was there something there that I should have seen? But you, you know? You don't... What I'm just thinking, when you're in a relationship, everybody fights in a relationship, right? You know, I've been married, oh God, I don't know how long now. It's coming up, so I should know. <laughs> um, but you know, we all argue, especially when you have children or, you know, life is stressful. So how do you know when just a regular argument is something more? That when you are having a regular argument, um, the argument is equal so that mm. Okay. You can articulate your point of view, your partner can articulate their point of view, and at some point of resolution you may agree to disagree or you'll hear one another out. Oftentimes in abusive relationships, what occurs is that the abuser is, abuse is about power and control within the relationship, mm -hmm. and so that the abuser uses many different tools to gain power and control, and that can be verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and if that works, an abuser may not escalate to physical violence until they feel as though all other v avenues of control are no longer working, mm -hmm. but in an abusive argument, the abuser may name call, put down, bring up things that they know are very painful mm -hmm. for you, uh, interject their will on what or not listen to you, will say the argument is over, I've said my piece but I'm leaving, you're, you know, and you're not able to then articulate your point of view or they may utilize physical violence or position their posture so that there is a level of fear within the argument or you know that if you disagree with your partner that there's not a freedom to disagree or there's not an ability to really articulate where you're coming from or your words are turned around mm -hmm. so that you're made to feel like 
maybe I shouldn't have said that, maybe I shouldn't have. And there's a questioning that occurs. So oftentimes, long before the argument, the abuser has been gaslighting you, where you start to really question your own reality. And one of the pieces of living with abuse is that you do start to question your reality because your abuser is very good at turning things around, undermining what you're saying, uh, questioning what you're doing, oftentimes will put you in a position of really questioning, maybe I am the person, maybe I am really bad, or maybe I shouldn't say or do what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. so there's this questioning so that when there's that argument, mm -hmm. you don't feel safe in it. And that in a healthy relationship, police aren't called to the home right. by neighbors mm -hmm. for a healthy relationship. Or when you're arguing with your partner, you don't think about, do I need the police to come and de-escalate mm -hmm. this argument? Uh, and that you feel safe. Yeah. That in a healthy relationship, you know that we can argue and I will be safe. And that this argument won't come back to haunt me again and again, or I won't get hurt because of this argument. They're very, um, very manipulative, mm -hmm. and um, they're very good at turning things around and making it be your fault that this, you know, that they were yelling or, you know, um, putting you down, you know, any of those things. Um, they're very, very good at they're manipulation. Very good at what they do. Oh yeah, 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 and they turn it, you know, turn it around so that it's you. You're the one who you know, is at fault for this argument and everything. I'm so glad that you brought all this up, especially for our young people, mm -hmm. right? That they see this, because it, it can start, I mean, middle school, right? I think we, yeah. we need to educate our, our middle schoolers. It start that young. Um, yeah. But I just want to switch gears for a minute, because I want to talk about the bill that you filed with um, Rep Cutler. So uh, this will come to a shock as a lot of people, as it did to me. So Sherry <clears throat> was stabbed many, many, multiple times and um, I'm gonna let you finish what we found out about stabbing. Okay, um, so in going to court, um, you know, I learned a lot of things going to court and it's, there's a lot of things um, that I just never knew or mm -hmm. anything. One of them being that somebody who gets stabbed, um, whether it be one time or several times, um, it's not attempted murder. They don't consider that attempted murder. So with Josh Cutler, um, who was my state rep at the time um, when I started this bill, um, you know, he, he was even surprised mm -hmm. that it he wasn't. Was, yeah. So he looked into it, talked to DAs and everything, and found that, wow, she's right. You know, this, this isn't part of attempted murder. So that's the bill that um, we, you know, started or whatever. Um, and it's H1507 mm -hmm. is the bill number. Um, and it's gone in to, um, is it legislative? It went into study. So study, yes. The bill, we yeah. had a hearing on the bill. And what was added, so the bill actually added stabbing to attempted murder. And right now, I believe it's poisoning is on there. Um, shooting. Shooting. And strangling. Strangulation. Um, and so this, this bill would add, stra um, add attempted st uh, stabbing, stabbing to yeah. this. Um, and they did. It did have a hearing and it went into study, which means they need some more information on this. Um, but we will refile that again. Right. Yep. Next session, we're going right. to refile that. We'll talk to House Council on it and if we need to change wording. But we will refile that again. Uh, and I'm sure our viewers are, are going to be as shocked as mm -hmm. that. And you know that my husband's in law enforcement and he was shocked as yeah. well when I told him. I couldn't even believe it. Mm -hmm. I really couldn't even believe it when they were telling me this, you know. It's, there's so many things I've learned from you and I've learned from Sandra and Karen. Um, and when we met with the DA, Sherry and I sat down with um, DA Cruz, that really <coughs> the victims don't really have a lot of rights. Do you want to speak to that, what your experience with that is? Yeah, when you're in the court system and everything, you as a victim, um, that, you know, we don't have many rights. We're not able to speak up at all in there. Um, all the rights are given to the monster, yeah. as I call him. Yeah. Um, and he was given six and a half to eight years for his sentence. 
unfortunately, um, they can earn 15 days of good time every month, um, which he's been adding, so his time is getting less and less, although they can only earn up to 35% off of their sentence. Um, so his sentence is, at the most, you know, the six and a half mm -hmm. to eight years. Um, my sentence my sentence is for the rest of my life. Right. For the rest of my life. Um, I've had five surgeries because of what he had done to me. Um, and I'm on some medication that I'll be on for the rest of my life. Um, so I just want people to know that the victims, their sentence is for the rest of their life. Yes. The whole rest of their life. And he'll be out. Yep. Yeah. He'll be out. I and mean, he he, he'll out. have probation for two years afterwards. Um, but whether, you know, whether or not he follows things or whatever. And I mean, if he cuts his ankle off, it's not a felony for them. Right. It, it needs to be, but it's not right now. It's just a misdemeanor. Which so. we've discussed that. Another thing we talked about, um, Sandra, which I didn't realize, was at the DA's office. Someone said, um, if if I assaulted my neighbor's dog, right, that would be a mm -hmm. felony, as it mm -hmm. should be. Right. You know, I'm a dog lover. I was just complaining about the hair on my legs earlier from the dog, the fur. Um, but it wasn't a felony to assault Sherry. Right. right. So that... Well, no, it was a felony, was a felony to, assault to assault me. me. But the stabbing. Right, the stabbing. The stabbing was. But if it was just, a, not just, and, and I don't want to downplay an assault that. assault and battery. Thank you. If it was an assault and battery, it would not be considered a felony. Right unless uh, you used a weapon. So um, the, it, there's a lot for victims that as you enter into the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. it can feel as, it, because when we look at the criminal justice system, the criminal justice system was founded that the um, offender is considered not guilty until proven guilty. Right. So there's that automatic assumption that this person walking into court, well, not assumption, but the foundation mm -hmm. is this person is not guilty until proven. Mm -hmm. But where that puts the victim <coughs> is that already a system is looking at the victim that, well, if this person is not guilty until proven guilty, then are you lying? Then are you not telling, you know, and that the goal of the defense attorney is to undermine the truth and veracity of the victim. Right. And so you're already one foot, one right. step down because of how the structure of the system. And I mean, there is a reason why it was structured that way, but what it does, especially to domestic violence survivors as well as sexual assault survivors, mm -hmm. is that it already puts you in that position of having to really prove your own truth. And by proving your own truth, you're rehashing your trauma over and over and over again. And abusers are constantly telling their victim that they're lying or they're not telling the right. truth or no mm -hmm. one's going to believe mm -hmm. you. No one's ever going to believe you because they're so manipulative and good at what they do that oftentimes to the outside world, they appear to be the nicest person you might ever meet. Mm -hmm. And so the victim already has that uphill battle. And then they have a system saying really the same thing, prove to me that mm -hmm. this really happened. And you're sitting there saying, I've lived this. Mm -hmm. This is my life. This is my trauma. This is my world. My world has come crashing down on me. And you're asking me, am I telling you the truth? And there are very few survivors who want to go into court, right? want to file a restraining order, and you do it to be safe. But, you know, when you're questioned, that can be, it, it just brings it back to, these are the same stories I heard from, you know, the same thing I heard from my abuser, and now other people are asking me. I also learned that um, when you, or when, the, when with the court, when they're doing the dangerousness hearing, um, a lot of times they don't have any outside information on the defendant, right. like from another court or mm -hmm. something. They don't have that information. Yeah, right. They don't get that fast enough. So sometimes they may say, you know, that 
they find that he's not dangerous because there's no just, priors. Right. But then there really there could be. So that's part of the dangerousness bill. Exactly. Right. That they can bring that in. Yeah. I would love to have both of you back. Um, but I wanna you know I thank you every day mm -hmm. and you're empowering so many women and and men as well. You know, I don't I wanna leave out our men that are victims as well. Yeah. Um and, and just to just just to be clear, this show is about domestic violence. This dangerousness bill has many other meanings, but we're focusing on our domestic violence victims. And I think it's so important, again, that we keep talking about it. Mm -hmm. We keep talking about it because people don't want to talk about it because it's ugly. Mm -hmm. It's ugly, it's uncomfortable. And I think you're doing everybody a justice by being so strong and being such an advocate. And I thank you for what you do. I thank mm -hmm. Karen, who's behind the camera, for everything that you do and all the stories that you hear and know that you have my support, always. Okay. We'll be right back with our State House Minute. On each episode of Profiles, I like to take a minute to take my constituents out of the 12th Plymouth District and provide a quick update on what is going on up on Beacon Hill. In March, the House of Representatives passed the annual Chapter 90 bill which provides funds to towns and cities to improve and maintain their roads and bridges. This bill, which gets its funding through borrowing, provides money to municipalities based on road mileage, population, and employment numbers. The legislation also authorizes $30 million for the Municipal Small Bridge Repair Program, $30 million for the Complete Streets Grant Program, $25 million for municipal grants for business-related projects, and $25 million for grants supporting the efforts to increase access to mass transit and commuter rail stations. I was proud to support this le legislation, which not only provides the funding our communities expect each year, but gives them an access to new sources of funding to increase the quality and accessibility of transportation in their towns. I want to thank Sherry for joining us today and for sharing her story with us. I also want to thank her for her incredible work in advocating for victims of domestic violence and for working towards meaningful and lasting change that will help to prevent domestic violence situations and protect the survivors of this horrible incidence. Thank you for watching, and I hope you'll join us next month for Profiles with myself, Kathy Lenatra.